Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm very comfortable in the statistics environment. I was 10 years on the faculty at uh, NC State. My title there was Senior Research Technologist. So I, I just had a master's degree. I was a physics major, but I loved the software challenges. And the biggest challenge, I guess, of my life was SAS. I'm going to take you through my life from the very start. I called it the search for understanding. We're all, that's why we're all here at the university, is to understand. I think it's an unbelievably basic drive of all us humans. Well, <clears throat> when I was eight years old, I read the book Robinson Crusoe, and it, this was an incredibly inspiring book. Uh, it said it has a spiritual, deep spiritual meaning, but I never th thought about that when I was a kid. But the guy was shipwrecked on an island and he had to recreate the world. So it was incredibly interesting. He went into the volcano and harvested sulfur, made his own uh, carbon, and I don't know where he got the saltpeter, but he made his own gunpowder. So he was recreating his, his world. I like the theme of doing something from nothing. Well, when I was 12, I read the autobiography of uh, Ben Franklin. Ben wrote it for his 12-year-old son at the time. And it was a book that was, in the 1890s, required reading of almost every student in America. And it was a required reading of every student in uh, Germany at that time. It was a fairly short book, but it emphasized uh, virtues, how to obtain virtue, and it went through his, his whole life that from essentially nothing to building self up to somebody. And he retired at the age of 40 or in his 40s uh, and devoted himself to public service. It's also said that he's the second most important man for our freedom here in America, first being Washington and second being Franklin because he got the French to come in on our side. Well, here's a picture of me in my high school yearbook, and the editors put this thing up here and said uh, uh, I was an inventor in original ways of doing physics problems. Well, I wanted to be an inventor as a kid. I read all T Thomas Edison stuff, and you know that was my my dream. So I go off to NC State <clears throat> in '58, and I wound up studying physics there. But in 1960, I went to the White Sands Missile Range as a student trainee. I uh, wasn't doing that well in college. I dropped out, went there, and uh, they put me on a monitoring station out in the middle of the desert. Now, this was pre, this was before we were sending up satellites, but they had a Redstone rocket there, which is the first rocket that we sent into space. And I saw several Redstones take off, but I had a, I'll call it a dumb job on a monitoring station in the middle of the desert doing nothing. Because we were eventually going to do uh, monitoring of who's on what frequency. But I hated the job, and my friends were programming. So this got me into the programming idea. I wanted to be a programmer. I got a job programming in 1960, but the powers to be wouldn't let me transfer, so I quit and went home to New Jersey. I, I uh, hitchhiked all the way back to New Jersey from New Mexico. That was the longest hitchhike I ever did. <laughs> so in 1962, I started my master's. And this is uh, Dr. Wesley Doggett, who was, he was at least temporary head of the physics department. And he was um, incredibly um, formative with my uh, professional life. Well, I had an assistantship in physics, but I thought it would be more interesting to be programming, so I took one 
in the statistics department. And this was the computer that was to be there. We didn't even have the computer. So it was six months out till the computer came. But this computer had was a business computer. They no longer have this dichotomy. They used to have business computers and commercial compu and scientific computers. And the business worked on decimal, scientific worked on binary. That, that dichotomy has long since gone away. The computer was going to come. They gave me a list of instructions. So I never even saw a program written. But I had the list of instructions. So um, I had two other people that were in the team. But they quit after two weeks because this uh, virtual computing was, was not uh, their cup of tea. Well, the computer came six months later, and I had literally six weeks to get it going because I was leaving for a summer fellowship. Now, the assignment was to write an analysis of variance program. So I went to see Dr. Grandage, who had written a, a program for a computer that was sort of a pre-computer, one that could read cards, punch cards, and uh, had a drum for memory. But anyway, Dr. Grandage said that he was all done with computing. They're changing it every year. So he was not going to step forward. But Dr. Grandage, when you looked in the ACM, he had written half the programs in statistics back in his day. Shows that we <laughs> computers are pretty new. Well, the second year I wrote a regression program, and uh, I learned about floating point arithmetic. And I actually wrote a language for that to translate to transform the data, doing the log and square root exponentiation as well as multiplication addition. So I actually generated machine language to do that. But then the programs were 90% of what they did on the campus for computing. And they sent those programs around to the university statisticians of the Southern Experiment Stations. You know, one probably doesn't realize this today but statistics started in agriculture, started in the Rothamstad Experiment Station in England in 1920, came to Iowa State uh, with, uh, I think it was Co Cochrane, and then uh, came from that nucleus several people to NC State, Gertrude Cox being the leader in 1941. To, that was the first Department of Statistics in the United States was at NC State. So agriculture was where statistics came. Obviously today, biostatistics, you're either doing it on people or you're doing it on animals, right? So it's still the way statistics is. Well, I got my master's degree and then took off to work for IBM at the Pentagon. And we were going to put all the military information into the computer. We reported to the National Military Command Support Center which is right underneath the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So it was at the pinnacle of the uh, administrative uh, apparatus at the Pentagon. And my, my office, I think, was right below here, because this actually is a three-story building underneath the ground. It was like a dungeon. And it was not, not the way, not like going to Google. In fact, um, uh, we had all these dilapidated tables and we got some used doors we put in between and we set cinder blocks and made a bookcase and whatever so it was we had to build our own environment but I was loving it I was writing uh, the assembler language for the IBM 1410 and I was the only one who had ever written a program in the 1410 so I was way ahead and I even used the operating system which was fairly new back then well this represents bombing over Haiphong, and uh, Bobby Kennedy called over to the Pentagon and said, uh, how many bombs have we dropped over Haiphong Harbor in the last so many months? And I had just written a program which would roll the operating system out or, and the applications out. You go up to the, the typewriter, roll them out, roll this query thing in. I had a query language which the full ands, ors, and parens, but it had circle search and polygon search, so it dealt with coordinates. So they were able to answer his question, how many bombs did we drop in the last 60 days within 30 miles of High Flung Harbor? And Bobby sent a letter back to the powers to be at the Pentagon saying thank you for this quick response. It was, it was exactly what I needed. 
So that was uh, some recognition, but kind of indirect for my work there. Now, what we worked on was the formatted file system. And this is the genealogy of it, of IBM's database management offerings up until, I guess, 1970. And as you can see, where the red line is, the formatted file system, the, is, the last acronym is National Military Command System Support Center. And those are the people that we served. Now, SAS came from there in the, in the idea that we had the self-defining file, a very powerful idea, which is the relational data model. So uh, that was a light bulb went off when I was at work in the Pentagon. If I had that idea back when I was at, at uh, NC State, I could have had a much better system. Well, the IBM 360 was announced, and we get the manuals on the bookcase, and it's pretty impressive that there's a whole different way of computing going to come. And this is a fair representation of the computer that I programmed at the Triangle University Computing Center. Then they also had the PL1 reference manual. And I looked at it, I said, wow, this language is so much more consistently defined than other languages. They had a uniform lexicon for the entire language. And I said, you know, that is a neat idea. If I had that idea, I, I, it would, would have made both programming easier and would have made the, the whole system more consistent. Well, anyway, I had a bit of depression at the Pentagon. Uh, it's, t it's too much to believe. <laughs> they told me I was too, too productive. And they said, we're going we're gonna to put you in charge of operating systems. But we didn't get an operating system but once a year. So I didn't even have a job. And so I'm pretty much um, lost. And then NC State calls. I, I hopped on the bus, got the job. I gave it the name Statistical Analysis System because I'm a uh, systems guy. Anyway, I'm working away. I did the um, data step and the, um, the input statement and the transformation. I got the analysis of variance program going. And um, we didn't. I, I guess we had some weak regression program, but um, in the statistics, there were two groups. There was the ag consulting, and there was the biomathematics group. Curly Lucas was in charge of the biomathematics group. And Curly was the master of the general linear models. And he could handle analysis of variance type problems using the general linear models, where you had Patients who died. It had a well-designed experiment, but you had patients who died, couldn't take the medicine, they dropped out or whatever. So Curly Lucas could salvage these uh, experiments with the general linear models. And he had Jim Goodnight working for him, writing Fortran programs, generating the dummy variables, and whatever. So I said to Jim, hey, our have done the uh, model statement, the class statement. Uh, so I've done the language. I'll get your dummy variables generated for you, and you can put your software into SAS. So this was an incredible addition to, to it. It was the, it was the um, killer app, so to speak, of SAS was general linear models, at least at that time. It was incredible um, also because now there was a statistician working on the, the work. It was, uh, it was me and some other people who sort of nameless people working on it before then. So that was an incredibly asset. So Jim and I uh, um, became the co-leaders of the uh, project. Now that's the first uh, manual that we had in 71, and I put that cover together and I did some illegal things. I went to the National Geographic and I got a logo. And uh, the, the in the other logo was from the uh, newsletter of the Triangle University's Computing Center. Also about the same time, a gentleman in town who had a business uh, doing data processing told me, he said, do you have any ideas for programs that, you, that could be sold? I said, well, you know, they're having so much trouble 
with student programs taking so long to compile and test that I think I can speed that up. And so he said, well, I'll, I will um, provide the computer time, I'll do the marketing, and you write the program, and I'll split the uh, profits. Well, it turned out the university gave me time to, to debug the, on the computer, to debug the program. And I got this program, which was called the Linking Loader. He sent out press releases. And I guess that I, the other thing was that I thought was so, such an important lesson was he said, well, you need a brochure. I, th I spent all of two hours on that brochure. So we're up and going with, with a press release, and we get the computer world to, to put this on. It was on the inside page article. One time we were on the cover of a computer world. But uh, now I'm making as much money off of this. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just collecting the money. And uh, I said, well, this is too easy being in business. Well, that same guy merged his company with um, a company out of Dallas called uh, University Computing Corporation. And he said, well, they've got a workstation that works with the UNIVAC. Uh, it doesn't work with the IBM. They'd have a new market if they could make it work with the IBM. I told him, you were the right guy who could write the software. So uh, he asked me, well, would I take the challenge? And this is, I always liked the challenges. So this was a challenge, a 4K computer. You know, now we're talking about gigabytes, right? <laughs> this is a 4K computer, 12 bits, um, had a, well, anyway, six instructions. I wrote a assembler that would run on the IBM mainframe so I could compile my programs. Anyway, I took my program down to Dallas. They had their own cross compiler that went on the UNIVAC. And I got that to work. I was always after challenges. Now this represents the program that will finally process me on my way out. It's the death records program. I wrote the death records program. Most people don't know it exists. But uh, I find it somewhat bizarre, but a, a death record is produced, and it doesn't have the underlying cause of death on it. So you have to use certain rules to figure out what the underlying cause of death. Those are codified by nosologists. So uh, I use sort of a set theoretic approach to, to expressing these things, and uh, well, they were very happy with it. We went up to Wisconsin, installed it at the state of Wisconsin, used it at the national level, and we went up to Canada and installed it there. And I think it spread at least to all the English-speaking parts of the world. And another fellow in the, in the statistics department was a bit of a gambler, and he said, uh, hey, uh, Edward Tharp, Dr. Edward Tharp, who wrote this book, he said, nobody could uh, calculate uh, exact probabilities for blackjack especially a four-deck blackjack. I said, well, I'll give it a try. And I came up with the exact probabilities. And then after the Duke University people had the Duchess program, the first chess program that was competitive with people, they used the same method. They used a memory to memorize positions they had previously computed. So they didn't have to go all the way to the bottom for the search. They could get the stuff out of the memory of previous, you know, five, six, and six, five, the same thing, right? So that was pretty much the, uh, the way I solved it was exactly the same. And this fellow was in the forestry department. He comes to me and says they're having trouble cutting lumber in the forestry industry. And as a big mistake, I said, oh, you know, you could have a machine that would scan the lumber. He actually got $88,000 to build the machine. So we built the machine, 18 months. It was uh, the most stressful time of my life. Uh, I had two full-time jobs, but only one, but the university only paid me two half-time positions. I had to solve the two-dimensional trim problem and uh, do the pattern recognition. Anyway, Sandy formed a company with me, Bar Mullen Incorporated. It's SAS 70, uh, 73, I guess. This man contacts us, and he's doing computer performance evaluation. 
this became a new market for us. Uh, so we had doubled our market of doing pharmaceutical and then doing this. 1973, I get a call from Mexico, and the um, fellow on the other end said, I'm Fernando Alguien, I'm calling from Mexico. Now in those days, nobody called you from out of state, it's too expensive, but all the way from Mexico. So he said, uh, we're interested in your software, could you install it? Uh, I said, well, that's not important, uh, but we could. He said, can you install it this weekend? So he shows up on Thursday. On Friday, we fly down to Mexico, and we stole, installed it uh, at the Simit facility. I say, this is Norman Borlaug, who got the uh, Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution. I felt we had arrived. John Saul comes in 73, and he was the most productive programmer I ever saw in my life. And he did so much in economics and statistics. And he did the matrix language. And actually, I've just he revealed it. He was angry with me because I said that isn't SAS. I, mean, I, I really thought it was valuable. I said it wasn't SAS because it wasn't for uh, the masses, so to speak. This is perhaps shows the biggest contribution of my life. Um, when I was in North Carolina, a man came up to me and said, well, do you have any regrets, things that you didn't do right in SAS? And I said, no because I rewrote it three times. I always fix the mistakes. But I thought after that, I, there are mistakes, that I defined the, the merge statement. It should have been called the join, because that's what they use in the relational data model. So that's a mistake in, in terminology. And I guess I, I, in statistics, you always talked about observation. So I talked about observation. Most people would say record or object. So it's a, a different terminology that separates SAS from the rest of uh, computer science. Then we move across the campus and form SAS Institute in 76. We were called by the powers to be over to the administration building and said, we've got a big problem with you leaving the campus. So what's the problem? You know, we thought that all the software is in the public domain. That's the way it was back in those days. So they had no hold on us for the software. So we were just moving off campus, and anybody could take that software and do anything they wanted to do with it at the time. Well, the problem was completely unexpected. They said, well, the university signed all these service agreements to service the, this for, the, for a year. So half those service agreements were still in effect. And the university's obligated. I said, well, we were going to do that anyway. Well, he said, well, the right thing is for us to pay you for those service agreements, to prorate it. So we were wealthy when we started the company. It was incredible. And here's how, how it was. I had 40%, Jim Goodnight 35%, John 8 This Jane Helwig uh, was a, a gifted writer. And she said... Um, about writing, you write for the 12 year old, the PhD will sneer at it, but everybody will understand it. Well anyway, 79 I left, and I decide, well I'm gonna bring this uh, lumber cutting machine to life. A lumber cutting machine takes the lumber, produce dimension parts, and uh, I was gonna actually do the whole thing. So I rented a warehouse, went off to school to learn how to do electronics, five-day course at VPI was offered how to do your own digital electronics. And I bought a computer with a 68,000 chip in it, so now I had a mainframe on my desk, but the money was going, money was going. So I got cold feet on it after a year. So I thought, well, I would uh, build a new language. I was going to call it Friday because in Robinson Crusoe, he had Man Friday who helped him with everything. So I would, would do that. So I studied what uh, the thinkers of the day was. Chomsky's book, 56 Syntax, was a big, big thing. And I was going to learn all about language. He talked about the underlying grammar that all people have because we can all understand language. But he never described what it was. Wouldn't it be something if we could figure out what the underlying grammar was? I was going to do that. I, I saw a little example of the Bacchus-Nor form 
written in the Bacchus Nor form. Now, Bacchus Nor form is a meta language for defining uh, the syntax of computer languages, and it is the standard methodology that all computer languages are, are defined formally with. Well, Bacchus and Nor both came up with the same idea, and Bacchus is the inventor of Fortran, and Peter Naur was the editor of the Algol 60 report. Both of them were gifts for language, and the two were all, sat on that committee. So I found this example of the BNF of BNF. Well, it's the grammar of grammar. And I thought, well, that's a fantastic idea. And if you could edit in the space of meaning instead of edit in the space of characters, wouldn't that be incredible? Uh, we'd always know what we're talking about instead of having to parse it to figure out what we're talking about. This book is called The Dragon Book. Half of it is how to parse the strings of characters for, for compilers. So uh, wouldn't it be something if we could live in a world where we didn't have to deal with syntax? Well, this is my simple thing. Um, you know, the woman who wrote the... 72 uh, user's guide told me, I, I asked her what I was doing. I said, well, I'm uh, inventing a language for statistics. And she said to me, well, only a god can do that, can invent a language. So I thought, well, I'm going to make everybody into a god because if we have an editor which is controlled by the grammar of grammar, so you can only produce a valid object of language X, then, you know, <coughs> No syntax errors here. Then if you had the grammar of grammar, which would define the grammar of language X, this up here, then anybody could create their own language. So I'd make a god out of everybody. And then here's the ultimate thing. If, since the grammar of grammar was a grammar, it would define itself. And this is sort of cognitive closure. Every question you might have about this system was answered inside the system. The problem is the system wasn't good for anything. It was good for defining syntax. And I'm four years without, a, without an income. So I gave a, a talk about it, and I invited my friends over. I showed them on the computer, and it was, it was exciting. I felt enlightened, but uh, it was not a product. So I abandoned that, and I designed this communications board, the only piece of hardware I ever designed, and I had a company and Raleigh built it, and seven months later I'm making money doing communication software, sort of like I did on that PDP-8, but now it's on the P PC. In 85 I moved down here. In 95 we're making a million dollars a month on our, with, you know, at that time maybe 40 people, not bad. Now I got enchanted with the uh, whole concept of quality. I mean, Actually, this is, I know medicine's going through a quality revolution right now. But it was just, to me, it was just marvelous that you could define in 14 pages how to produce quality. And I, it's like a mathematical treatise. And they had the motto, say what you do, do what you say, and prove it. Well, this is, I made my own temple. We're going to worship quality at the office. So that was, that was where my mind was at at that time. I'm just going to throw this in because I did start a company to, um, or funded a company to bring my employee satisfaction survey instrument to uh, the market. It's a psychometric instrument. And the beauty of it is that it solves the problem of everybody has the same set of career values. But everybody values those things differently. So if they make their own bar chart here to express their values, just using, I, I used a mouse to do that, that you could have people express both how the specific situation satisfied the value and the weights that they put on the value. You know, minister meaningful work is probably everything to them. But an hourly employee, Compensation and benefits is 90% of what they value. It's really true. So now I uh, sold my company to this guy. This is Gabriel when he was in his prime, I guess. 
And uh, he, it was a chess champ who was recruited to Gainesville to teach, to mentor uh, kids in school. After I sold my company, I decided I would do the, bring quality to everybody. And this, I worked on an enterprise model. But you know, it gets to 2012, and I'm out of money. So I go to the banks in town and say, hey, I've got uh, probably $8 million worth of collateral here. Can you give me a loan? And they say, no, we won't give you a loan. All bank after bank, the bankers said the same thing. Well, I'd give you the loan, but the, the regulators won't let me because they had made cash flow to be so important. And this actually affects software companies and affects people in the construction industry quite a bit. So again, I decide, well, I'll go back to something that just takes brain work. So I decide, well, I'm going to work on a model of reality. And I thought up that name, but I say God gave me AMOR as the acronym, so I'm going to use it. And here is something that's a very patriotic number. Can anybody give me what a patriotic number might be? Well, 1776. So I'm going to re represent a reality in terms of bits. This is Kirsten Nygaard and Dahl. They were the inventors of uh, object-oriented programming. And I love this quote, to program is to understand. You know, if, if everybody could understand how uh, computer programs worked, wouldn't we have a, a change in the mindsets of people, especially if they had the type object model in their mind? It would be incredible change. I, Plato goes back and talks about forms and, and objects. And so it's going way back to the, to the Greek days, but we're, we're not, we haven't caught up. Well, you know, we walk through the world, and why don't we walk through the computer? You know, this is the way our mind has been, been programmed by evolution to deal with the three-dimensional world. And we see a building, and we open the door, and we go inside. Well, that's a new world there. That's an abstraction that we've penetrated an abstraction just by walking through a door or taking a turn around a bend in a car. So um, wouldn't it be something if we could navigate through knowledge space? Well, I'm just having to say, how, how are we going to know things? Self-definition has been an outsized idea in my mind. And uh, this sculpture, uh, it actually is down in Winter Park who did this one, express self-definition. Why is self-definition important? If you can describe something in terms of itself, well, in this case, the little marionette's pulled by a bigger marionette. Who's pulling your strings? Well, it's a bigger marionette just like myself. Well, you have a complete description of who's pulling the strings here. It's always somebody bigger. And the cell is completely self-defining. Isn't that awesome? You know, we are, we could probably, somebody could probably take a skin cell and re make another one of me if they so des decided. Now, in the Bible, remember one of the most, Moses asks, who are you? And God says, I am that I am. And I just find this to be interesting is that in the, in the Bible, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The point of this is that uh, it's a philosophical statement. You know, what is uh, the start of everything? Well, we have to have language before we can start to think. And I just love this uh, particular book, To Thine Own Self Be True. It's a Shakespeare statement. But there cannot be any... We can never know the truth, but at least we ought to be able to be true to ourselves. So a, a computing system should be able to define itself in terms of itself and be completely true to all those definitions. And you have Ludwig Wittgenstein, pretty famous um, uh, philosopher of the 1900s. He wrote a whole book on people think in terms of pictures. And a quote from him is, a picture is a model of reality. 20 million kids are now programming with the scratch language using pictures. So it's proven that kids could intuitively understand pictures and think in those terms. 
Well, here's my simple pictures. This is, I guess it's interesting that Plato said we think in terms of forms. It's the ultimate uh, reality. But here's just a simple, here's a type. You have the, uh, the variable names, the type it is. But in the object, you have a particular instances of those. Now, what's the simplest picture that you could use to represent um, assignment? Well, if it's a picture the way you want it to be, what could be simpler? It's an intentional definition. Obviously, in programming, you do something like this. But in the pictorial language, you just do something like this, the way you want it to be. And here's just some examples. Here's logic is a, a, is a type that takes on the value uh, true and false. So you have the two possibilities of that. And here's a simple programming example where at the top you've got this object and you want to compute dollars and cents. Uh, you want it to be like this down below. So you have the picture here of um, cents being assigned to the multiplication of modulo total cost one. That'll give you the fraction, uh, 0.76 times 100 assigned to cents. Then the next thing is dollars is total cost minus cents over 100. And so this is the way you would do it in a programming language. Now, this is actually somewhat of a picture. When you take Programming 101, the biggest lesson they have is you've got to make your program look legible. You have to use indentation. You have to make it pictorial before you can even read the characters. So we are uh, using pictures to a certain extent when we program. Now, my feeling is that the whole world is stuck in symbols and characters. It's obviously a very easy way for us to read and write. But if the computer can draw the pictures for us, then we can move into a new world where we express ourselves through pictures. You know, inheritance is such a beautiful uh, part of the object-oriented programming paradigm. So you inherit new types of things from uh, simpler types. Object being the, the top of the inheritance tree and uh, I actually use a, a, I think that if you think of the world as objects connected to other objects, we shouldn't actually use the word variable. We should use the word connection. But there's several different types of connections. In the upper right, you see we've got the variable connection. They're different for every instance of an object. You've got the ones that are constant, which are really factored into the type. You've got the global ones that are the same in every, every constant. And then you've got parameters that are passed into a program. So those are the different types of connections that you deal with in programs. Um, I actually had some psychological problems with this one. Because, uh, you know, as I told Marty uh, when he introduced himself, do you want to change the world or recreate the world? So this was... In, in uh, the object, you would have a constant where, where it was the world. And in the world, you'd have the list of all the people in the world, the list of companies, the list of educational institutions, the list of governments. Now, this would be like the .com. This is be like the .edu, the, like the .gov. But you have to start off. If you're going to have a model of the world, you've you got to start at the the world being the outermost object. And uh, wouldn't it be something if we could consistently define everything in the world in a single formalism? What I'd like to do is unify the world, unify types and objects, such that um, we see types being constructed the same way objects are. And uh, so we can understand. So here's my, my, the logo I came up with. And, the strongest force in the universe, I say. It's, it's a dream. I sold my property, so I now have um, money in the bank where I can uh, hire some people to help me. And that's my goal is to find the right people to help me. And uh, I don't expect this thing to be ever completed by myself. I'm too old. But I can get the ball rolling is my my thought. So that, 
that's what I have to offer. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, John Schuster. Uh, why do you think SaaS is on the decline? I have, an, I have my answer, but what is your answer to declining? Well, I give you my stepson works for SaaS. And he told me they made a fatal error. And uh, the fatal error was like seven years ago they started to charge academics for it, so the people jumped onto R. Once you get people onto R, these undergraduates, they become graduate students, then they become professors, you've lost it. It's the, that's the, the thing. Now, the other thing about R is it has the virtue that the output of every procedure is, a, is another object. Uh, that, I think, is the correct way to be thinking about the world. I should have added to my talk the, the, what I think is the correct model for computing is you have the type object model to describe your space of objects. You have your um, Microsoft calls business rules, but it would be your programming. And those are the bottom two levels. And those are the levels that I think that this covers. The top level presentation is art. And there's no one solution for that. And that's not what you people deal. You don't deal in that world of art. <laughs> you deal in relationships between things. So. What I, what I think one of the big factors is that for those of us who grew up with SAS, we can make SAS per, but we, it's, there's such an investment in getting there that uh. we had no choice. So we can make SAS per, and we can outperform. You know, people write programs in R. There may be programs in R that can perform but when we program in SAS, we can clobber them, time-wise, memory-wise. You know, lack of memory. However, that skill just is. There's too much of a mountain to climb today. And I see. To a reasonable level. Yeah. And that's something I think SAS could, could work on. Right. I I I really haven't had anything have had anything to do with SAS in 79, so I, I'm pretty much ignorant about it, is to tell you the truth. I haven't been there to but visit. You, were, or, you, you programmed in SAS in those days. So you, oh, I helped everybody. Yeah. I helped everybody. I mean, I was, yeah. uh, I, I actually <laughs> think. I programmed PL1 and you know, in SAS. It was such a natural to get into it. Yeah. I think that uh, since I did this tech support, I made sure the error messages were very precise, that, uh, People weren't calling me about missing semicolons. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious um, if we if we conceive of the qualitative quantitative gap that your interest in quality, how that's reconciled in a in a quantitative paradigm. So it's, I, I find that often qualitative researchers are looked askance by quantitative. So there's qualitative data, there's quantitative data, and, and it may be a complete stretch of what your concept of quality is, but it just it, it triggers some thought in me. Well, about that. I showed you that uh, quality temple. Say what you do, do what you say, prove it. In 2000, they added a fourth column, which is improve it, continual improvement. So it's, it's a methodology where you give consistent results and you attack the problem areas to reduce the, the uh, problems. It's not so, it's absolutely, maybe doesn't fit the creative world. Um, the, your, your distinction, qualitative, quantitative, uh, I'm having a little hard time answering that, but the, what I felt was that um, uh, as a simple-minded thing is my Rotary Club. I try to get them on the quality <laughs> agenda. At least we write down instructions. 
These people look at instructions. We make the instructions better. We perform better the next year. We can collaborate. Other, people can, other clubs can see how we're doing and use those. Uh, the idea of writing things down and sharing and getting together and discussing. And in my company, we'd get together and discuss how we're going to do something. We'd document it. Then we'd do a, if it was an important change, we'd say, this is an important change. Somebody could press the button and see the things that were different. And that's all we had to do to affect change is we just said, here's the way we're going to do it. Everybody's expected to do it the new way. So it's, I thought it was too simple, actually. But um, um, it, this is actually a big problem, I think, in, in our society. The Japanese are very formal. I asked my auditor for ISO 9000, where has he seen it best? He said Mexico. The Mexicans are very, very much into quality and, and getting things done right. So, uh, and I, it must be, you know, like you got Singapore is this very structured world too. Uh, we're not big on structure here in America. I think we could use more. And it should be an open system where everybody contributes to the instructions, to the way we operate. There's another thing which is kind of a pretty damn interesting thing too, is you can you just use one word, authority. You've got the, the instructions, the authority for how to do it. There's somebody who's the authority for, can approve, to approve a new instruction. Then there's who, who his boss is and who's that boss is all the way up to the top. And interesting enough, I mean, this is, Marty's always asks all these God questions, but it was very, to me, this was an interesting thing. When we split the company into two pieces, the, comp the enterprise model was only had one person at the top. So we had to create this, it was a woman's picture we had up there, a profile of a woman, um, just black and white. Um, but anyway, it was called the ultimate, uh, the administrator anyway. Everybody reported to her. You know, is that we have to have, everybody has to think that they're under some authority, some higher authority. So I say the, the ultimate thing in, in, a, in a computer system is you've got something that represents a person. That's the authority for that person. So everything can be traced to authority. And it wouldn't be something if we could clearly document authority in all the world. Thank you.